to act on the notebook and write in it and pick it up. Whereas Inga is not. Inga doesn't need to perceive and to act. Maybe if you're looking for a principal boundary for the mental, perception and action mark that principal boundary for the mental. What's inside the boundary of perception and inside the boundary of action is mental. What's outside is not. Skin and skull are unprincipled boundaries, but maybe perception and action form principal boundaries. So that, I think, if you, for me, if you're going to resist the extended mind thesis, that's the place to resist. Now, you immediately get into a back and forth dialectic here. We've got the proponent of the extended mind indicated here as TXM. Um, Otto's access to the notebook needn't be seen as perceptual. You know, it's not really perception, it's cognitive, it's just like memory retrieval. At this point, the opponent says, well, come on, look. there's just no denying that Otto sees the notebook. That's perception. He writes in the notebook. That's action. There's just, looks like there's just no getting around that. Seeing is a kind of, seeing is a kind of perception. Well, maybe these cases might be assimilated to a kind of inner perception um, and a kind of mental action. We know there's things like internal, you know, examination of mental images, the kind of inner perception. There's mental actions when we try to calculate things, we decide things. And so it's a kind of action, but it's all inside this, inside the cognitive system. Well, the opponent could say those are real perception and real action, and that's where there's a distinction to be drawn there, and that's the relevant distinction. Now, uh, the proponent of the extended mind might say, well, let's just reject the proposed boundary. You know, for example, we, we all know the, uh, the case of the Terminator, right? Uh, the Terminator has access to a whole bunch of information, but, uh, but uh, and the way the Terminator retrieves his information is by reading it off the internal phenomenological movie screen, right? It's like a, a target in front of you, uh, a target in front of me, uh, yes, uh, you know, bald, white male, appropriate clothing, yes! Uh, grab, you know, grab all the, grab all the clothing, and on you go. So that's, it, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the Terminator's belief system. Um, the Terminator has access to his beliefs by reading stuff off the, uh, the screen. Incidentally, it's, uh, it's an interesting fact that the, uh, the Terminator movies appear to uh, appear to endorse the possibility of machine consciousness because they, they actually show us directly the, uh, the Terminator's first-person point of view. Um, still, I mean, the opponent might, might try and uh, hold the line here by saying the Terminator really doesn't believe those contents before reading them off the screen. If you've got to read them off the screen, that's not really belief. Now, around this point, you could argue that the opponent of the thesis has a certain amount of folk psychology, common sense, psychological classification on their side. The cases where access, many cases at least, where access requires perception are not intuitively counted as, a, as mental, as beliefs. But around this point, I think, the proponent of the thesis shouldn't be afraid of some mild revisionism. I mean, the question isn't how does common sense psychology classify these cases as beliefs or desires or whatever. How should they classify these cases? In particular, how should they classify the cases in order to get that these, that these, uh, the psychology will have the maximum explanatory purchase on the cases? And the claim will be that uh, extended states function in explanation in very much the way that uh, the beliefs function in explanation and so ought to be classified as beliefs, which you classified like the line here for the purposes of explanation. Still some reason for uh, ambivalence, though. A question, are these extended states on a, truly on a par when it comes to explanatory questions, including explaining the causes of action? So here's a worry. It looks like whenever it comes to the Otto case, uh, Otto and his notebook, we can always ask, I mean, Otto's reaching for his notebook is an action that he performs. He picks up his notebook and looks at it. We can ask, why did Otto reach for his notebook? Natural answer, because he wanted to go to the museum. He didn't know the location of the museum, and he believed that the notebook contained the information. Okay, very natural answer to give to that question. Note, though, that it includes, includes as part of the explanation he didn't know the location of the museum, which is really quite contrary to what the proponent of the extended mind thesis wants to say. That proponent is going to say, well, the notebook is part of his belief, knowledge, memory system, Therefore, he didn't know the location of the museum. So that's a point where explaining action seems to require going the non-extended Cartesian way. Well, here's what I think is the right thing to say about uh, all this. Some explanation, what you explain, and the kind of mental states you attribute to a system goes to some extent with explanatory context. In this explanatory context, it's natural to deny that Otto has the belief. Why did Otto reach for the notebook? 
because she needed to know where the museum was. In other explanatory contexts, it's natural to appeal to Otto's belief. Why did Otto walk north? Because of his standing belief about the museum's location, which he had all along. You know, it's the difference between explaining these very fine-grained actions and these very large-scale actions. So what this suggests is that the classification of a state, at least as one of these dispositional beliefs, depends to some extent on our explanatory purposes. Um, you know, uh, whether it's large-scale or fine-grained explanations of action, to put it more in more technical philosophical language, in different contexts, different background triggering conditions for the dispositions and dispositional beliefs become relevant to, uh, to explanation. I mean, we're always, we're used to this idea that, you know, someone who goes to church and they do believe in God, and it looks like when they're doing cosmology, they engage in various kinds of reasonings that looks like they don't believe in God. Why do they go to church? They believe in God. Why do they offer theory X? Because they don't. Different explanatory contexts. Um, maybe a better, close, more closely related example is information that takes work to retrieve or reconstruct from memory. Like, uh, you know, you got a, someone says, what's 11 times 12? And you got to work kind of hard. Yeah, it's 132. Did you, uh, you had to think for a moment. Um, did you know? Did you not know? Why did they take so long to answer? Ah, they didn't know. They had to reconstruct it. Why did they do so well on the test? Because they knew the answers. It's one of those in-between cases that can go, go both ways in different contexts. So I think really what's going on here is a kind of necrocube effect on the extended mind, which is the way I am. I'm inclined to see it. But our perspective on Otto's extended state itself actually flips as we switch explanatory contexts. We switch between seeing the cognitive system as something local, Cartesian, embedded within the head, and something extended extends out to the notebook or, or the iPhone. Access, Otto's access to the notebook flips between being seen as something like perception and as something like memory retrieval. Take the internal perspective as perception, take the external perspective, it's memory retrieval. Otto's writing in the notebook flips between being seen as mental action and as physical action. And Otto's prior state flips between being seen as, uh, as ignorance, the kind of ignorance and as a kind of knowledge. Now, I think there are various possible associated sto stories about exactly how you map this on to the semantics of English terms like beliefs or knows, but I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll skip over that here because it's a bit more of a philosophy of language. Uh, in, a, in a way, that's a terminological question about the semantics in English of beliefs and knows shouldn't mask the deeper point that extended states can function in explanation in very much the way that beliefs function and share a deep and important explanatory kind with them. So in, um, in the extended mind, the only extended states we argued for were the standing beliefs, dispositional beliefs, and maybe some cognitive processes like uh, mental rotation. Now, uh, interesting question, how far can you extend the extended mind? I mentioned already extending it to cases of desire. What about reasoning, uh, perception? My friend has a camera. Is that a kind of a extended perception, extended imagination? I'm sitting there in a talk and browsing away on my iPhone, text, images, and so on. So maybe that's a sort of form of extended daydreaming, the, in which the, uh, the iPhone is playing a certain constitutive role, extended emotion, and things in your, in your environment, buffeting your moods in certain ways. Maybe that's partly constituting your moods. My iPhone even has a decision maker. Now, do I really want to go to that talk at the, uh, talk at the conference? I call up the iPhone decision maker, and it's got a little yes or no machine, and I, I ask it, you know, should I go by, and it comes up, yes, go to the talk. Well, extended decision, make, decision making right there. Still, it's interesting and notable that all of the extended states discussed so far involve non-conscious elements, and really it's the non-conscious elements of the processes that are extended, like, you know, the retrieval of dispositional beliefs to consciousness. That means the part of the process which is non-conscious that's extended. So what about the big question, extended consciousness? Could, you know, the basis, the physical basis of a conscious state extend outside the head? Well, I see no reason in, in principle why this is impossible. Certainly so, ex 